test test one two. Mike, test one, two. Test one, two. Mike, test one, two. Test one, two. Can you hear me from here? Is this good? Mike, test good? This is not. Witness mic, witness mic. Mr. V, sir.
The subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, all members will have five days to submit statements, questions, and extraneous material for the record, uh, subject to the length limitation and the rules of the committee. Uh, we do expect vo votes to be called on the floor of the House. When that happens, we'll adjourn and we will reconvene when that voting uh, is completed. Today is a special day for two reasons. First, this is U UN Human Rights Day. And second, this is unfortunately the day when the human rights of the entire Congress will be abridged by knowing that uh, Mr. Yoho <laughs> will not be with us for more than an additional 12 months. But it is auspicious that today is Human Rights Day because this completes a series of three hearings of the subcommittee on human rights. First, we focused on Southeast Asia. Then we focused on South Asia. Much of that hearing was uh, uh, focused on Kashmir, but we also had one witness who focused exclusively on Pakistan, and we had considerable discussion regarding us Assam, Sri Lanka, uh, and, uh, and other issues. Today, we focus on uh, China. Uh, we were going to have a hearing covering all of Northeast Asia, but there's so much going on in China. Uh, I should mention that, that had we gone broader, that hearing would have covered North Korea. To honor uh, Human Rights Day, the uh, administration has refused to sign off on a UN Security Council discussion of human rights in North Korea. Uh, that uh, decision is, is definitely uh, questionable, um, and uh, the human rights in North Korea are an abomination that angers the world. Um, so this hearing will complete our three hearings uh, on human rights. Uh, and uh, I should also mention that I expect tomorrow that the Financial Services Committee will vote to make me chair of its Capital Markets Subcommittee. Those of you familiar with Congress uh, know that you can only have one gavel at a time. And uh, I don't, if I had a gavel here, I would hand it to the gentleman from Northern California, Mr. Berra, uh, who uh, I'm sure will take over this committee in the weeks and months to come wow. and has been an outstanding member. Uh, this, of course, is all subject to a meeting of uh, 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 Democrats on the F Foreign Affairs Committee, which I'm sure will go uh, very smoothly. So uh, I know this subcommittee will have completed its work on human rights hearings and will be in good hands uh, in the years uh, to come. Uh, today, uh, we focus on human rights in China. One of the greatest human rights crises in the world is China's strike hard campaign against the Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities in Xinjiang province. Uh, under the guise of counterterrorism, the uh, Chinese Communist Party is seeking to eradicate uh, Uyghur culture and religious belief. At least a million Uyghurs, and perhaps far more, are uh, in what Pentagon, one Pentagon official has called concentration camps. Uh, whether they are concentrated or not, they are camps surrounded by barbed wire where people are not allowed to leave. The Strike Hard campaign was also uh, uh, witnessed, uh, has also witnessed the systemic use of forced labor, uh, which is now unfortunately entangled in Western supply chains um, to a degree that we do not fully understand and perhaps our witnesses can enlighten us. The Communist Party has built an Orwellian surveillance state in Xinjiang uh, that is uh, gradually uh, being adopted uh, perhaps over across China and even worse may be a, a Chinese export. Uh, last week the House passed the Uyghur Act. The text that was passed was a uh, amendment in nature of the substitute that I wrote and presented to the full Foreign Affairs Committee. It was based on legislation uh, from three separate bills, one put forward uh, with legislation being put forward by uh, uh, Jim McGovern and Chris Smith, uh, by myself and uh, my uh, ranking member, uh, Ted Yoho, and by Jerry Conley and Ann Wagner as well. The Uyghur Act would require President Trump to impose the global Magnitsky sanctions against all Chinese officials who are responsible for the suppression of the Uyghurs. We are long past the point when this should be done, 
and it should not be linked to any ongoing negotiations on trade or any other subject. The legislation requires that the uh, Commerce Department uh, prevent uh, U.S. technology that can be used from to repress Uyghurs from being exported to China. This, pass, this bill passed, I believe, unanimously on the House floor, and I urge our colleagues in the Senate to pass the Uyghur Bill Act and send it to the President who should sign it. Uh, the last six months have seen massive protests in Hong Kong. At times, two million Hong Kongers out of a population of just over seven million have taken to the streets. These protests began in response to a bill that would have allowed people in Hong Kong to be extradited to mainland China, um, where uh, the court's respect for human rights is uh, highly questionable. Since then, the protesters have added four additional demands, including an independent inquiry into the police's excessive use of force, as well as universal suffrage uh, in Hong Kong in, in its elections. It should be worth noting that Beijing committed itself to universal suffrage in Hong Kong as part of its basic law for governing the city, but it is yet to make good on that promise. Uh, although uh, the Hong Kong government has withdrawn the extradition bill that initially spurred the protests, it has yet to commit to the protesters' other demands. Sadly, in recent weeks, there have been growing violence uh, by uh, the Hong Kong police and, to some degree, by demonstrators. Uh, and I would point out that the demonstrators in Hong Kong are most effective when they are peaceful. In response, Congress has passed the, uh, and the President has signed into law, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act and legislation that uh, restricting exports of certain police weapons to Hong Kong. Among other things, the Hong Kong uh, Human Rights and Democracy Act requires the Secretary of State to annually certify that Hong Kong still enjoys sufficient autonomy from the mainland to justify the U.S. giving uh, that territory preferential treatment on trade uh, and other economic concerns. I should also note that the House uh, passed the Stand with Hong Kong resolution, which I uh, introduced uh, with Ranking Member Yoho, Ms. Wagner, Mr. Conley, uh, and others. Uh, there are countless other human rights issues in Chinese today, including Tibet, where the Communist Party is seeking to uh, control who will secede to the uh, position of Dalai Lama when the current Dalai Lama passes on. On this issue, Jim McGovern and Chris Smith have introduced the Tibetan Policy and Support Act of 2019, which I am a co-sponsor of. Uh, I believe that the full committee will be taking up this bill shortly. Ranking Member Yoho has also has a resolution supporting Tibet's autonomy and uh, supporting the current Dalai Lama. Uh, but the Communist Party uh, is also seeking to extend political control beyond its borders. It is a threat not only to human rights within China, but also here in the United States. Many Americans uh, were first made aware of this when the Communist Party uh, targeted the Houston Rockets general manager because he chose to support the Hong Kong protests. Yet the NBA is far from a unique case, uh, for the Communist Party of China has used access to the Chinese markets to compel U.S. and foreign businesses to toe the party line on countless issues, from Taiwan to Tibet to Hong Kong to Xinjiang. Uh, uh, Hollywood, very important to my district, I represent more studios, I believe, in Congress than anyone else, has been especially targeted. What the Communist Party does is it says only 34 U.S. films can be shown in China each year. Then it dangles that in front of uh, studios, making it plain that their films will not be among the 34 if they were to dare to make a film about Tibet or Xinjiang or Hong Kong. Uh, I also fear that the Communist Party's efforts to control speech around the world will grow more intense as it introduces this social credit system. This system will give a social credit store to individuals and businesses based on their loyalty to the Communist Party of China. Uh, I re recently had a meeting with the former Chinese ambassador to the United States, who remains very active in policy, and several others from the embassy, where they all denied knowing that there was anything being worked on 
uh, called a social credit score in China. So without objection, I will enter into the record uh, 12 articles, all describing these in detail, all from publications respected in China. Um, this social credit score will also be used to penalize those who buy, say, American cars or otherwise uh, 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 help reduce the U.S.-China trade deficit. Um, I want for the record, though, to point out that I am not implacably anti-China. I have been the loudest voice on the committee for peace in the South China Sea and for a cooling off of naval relations between our countries. But uh, what China is doing uh, with regard to human rights is uh, something for us to focus on today on UN International Human Rights Day. And with that, I turn it over to the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Chairman. And there, there are 10 minutes uh, left in votes, Good. so uh, we can hear your opening statement or, uh, and then go to the floor. If All right. Want. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. I won't need more than 10. <laughs> <laughs> First off, thank you for the job you've done. I think you've been a very valuable and effective chairman. I'll be sad to see you leave, but I'm glad you're pointing to that fellow there because I think uh, Dr. Barra will do an outstanding job in, in your uh, footsteps, so thank you for your service. Um, the social credit scores of China, wow, what a powerful tool. Wouldn't any government love to be able to control their citizens so that nobody runs a red light, nobody crosses, jaywalks? What a great tool, but what a threat to freedom and liberty. Um, this is a scary thing that we're going on, and I, this meeting, this hearing is so important. I want to thank uh, Chairman Sherman and our brave witnesses for making the hearing uh, possible today. There is no more important talk, topic for the subcommittee to focus on. And this is a message that needs to get out to the world. This is something that our manufacturers, our NBA, not only the owners, but the players need to understand what is going on. How many people in the audience are from uh, Xinjiang or your Uyghurs or you've been to that area? How many people? And I'm doing this because I know China's probably going to watch us and I hope you guys are okay with that. Um, we know what's going on over there. And we're going to let the world know what's going on. It is unacceptable. We've been through this before. We saw General Eisenhower after World War II, when he went to the concentration camps, say never again. But it's going on, and it's going on right now. And every time you buy a product that says made in China, you're empowering the suppressive communist regime, which incidentally, in their, in their manifesto, in their, in their statements, say there is no higher power than the Chinese Communist Party, period. There is no deity. Xi Jinping is the closest thing to a deity in China. And the role of the Chinese people, according to the Chinese Communist Party, is to serve the Chinese Communist Party. Whereas in Western democracies, the role of the government is to protect the God-given rights of our citizens and to empower our citizens. And this is why this message and this hearing is so important, because that message needs to get out. When our manufacturers go over there, they do it for profit. When the NBA goes over there, they do it for profit at the expense of people that you know. The Chinese Communist Party's repression is the greatest threat to global human rights and democratic freedoms. As I said in an op-ed I published late last year titled China's Second Century of Humiliation, Xi Jinping is the most accomplished human rights violator alive today. And history will record that. And I hope he is listening. Our, witness today, our witnesses today are on the front lines of a global struggle against Xi Jinping and his communist party that offers socialism with Chinese characteristics. Give me a break. It's communism with suppression on steroids. <clears throat> they are leaders. They are leaders. The brave Hong Kongers like Joey here. Thank you for coming to our office. And I appreciate what you all are standing up to do. And I know you've put your life in jeopardy. But you're standing up for those innate values that we've all been born with of liberty and freedom. So thank you for standing against the CCP's foot soldiers to defend their rights and wake up the world to their threat. For Cot, you've shown the world a shining example of bravery in the face of oppression. Somebody heard one of your podcasts today. They were sharing the story and they broke down in tears with your story and I hope you share that today. 
as you fight to free his family from the horrific imprisonments. Dr. Richardson and Dr. Zenz, thank you for being here. You guys are global leaders in bringing the CCP's abuse to light. The human rights challenges we all face is massive in scale. The recent leaks of secret party documents on Xinjiang, the Xinjiang Papers, revealed the worst of the abuses occurring inside China and are personally directed by Xi Jinping himself. This is a wake-up call, and I'm glad these papers came out because this is people within the Chinese Communist Party knowing what he's doing is bad. And so this is something that the more we talk about this and the more we um, bring this out in the awareness campaign, the more it's going to affect their decisions. She has directed a party to use all organs of dictatorship to oppress people. Over and over again, the nature of the Chinese Communist Party is revealed, but despite the scale of these abuses, the world remains largely silent. Our goal is to make them wake up so that their hearing aids are turned on. <clears throat> In fact, many countries openly support the CCP's atrocities. In the UN and on the international stage, dozens of countries have defended China's concentration camps. Unacceptable. And the international response to Beijing's ongoing in interference in Hong Kong has been limited at best. More and more countries are adopting oppressive laws modeled after China's digital authoritarianism, and the CCP is uh, exporting its repression around the world. He has offered ZTE technology to Maduro in Venezuela. Iran wants it. Putin wants it. And I can't think of a better tool for a dictator to have than that. China subsidized tech companies sell dystopian technologies to dictators, and the CCP forces international businesses to echo its censorship and propaganda. You know, the NBA is a perfect example. Marriott Hotels for recognizing Taiwan. Airlines for saying we're flying to the country of Taiwan. Oh, you can't do that because you've offended somebody in China. Disney was going to show films, their new film coming out, that had um, the nine dash lines and said Taiwan was a province of, of China. Thank God for some of the ASEAN countries says, this is BS, you are not showing those movies in our country. I applaud those company, countries. The scale of CCP human rights abuses combined with CCP's ability to export these abuses globally has no parallel. We need to be on the right side of history. The world has never before been challenged by this kind of technology in a threatening and negative, suppressive way that China is using this today. The United States has taken some significant steps in 2019, including the enactment of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, um, the House passage of the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act. We passed the Cambodia uh, Democracy Act. But there is much more to be done, and we have not yet brought the full weight of the US government to bear. The world is still mostly silent on the CCP human rights. Without a mobilized international response, the United States has to continue to lead, and that is why I'm thankful for our hearing today so we can reflect, reflect their human rights leadership and our policy, and I look forward to discussing the current state of the CCP's repression and individual freedoms and democracy and suggestions on our next steps. And I'm looking forward to coming back because I'm kind of fired up about this. <laughs> Y'all take care. We'll see you in a minute. One thing that illustrates the need for human rights in China is that uh, one minute after we all leave, which is right now, I'm going to ask the cameras to turn off, and uh, my staff will work with anybody in the audience who cannot have their face on, uh, on the tape, so that we'll have a place where people can watch and where there will be no filming. Uh, with that, we stand adjourned until after votes.
I sh should point out, uh, so I believe staff has taken action to make sure that anybody who doesn't want to be in this video's face will not appear. I should point out that uh, I've got to commend Mr. Yoho for the title of his article, The uh, Second Century of Chinese Humiliation, now being humiliated by their own government. And I'll stack that up against uh, what my staff came up with as a title for this hearing, Authoritarianism with Chinese Characteristics. With that, uh, I'll ask whether anyone wants to make an opening statement. Uh, the man who will soon be yielding me sufficient time to make a m small opening statements at uh, hearings of this subcommittee, Dr. Barrow. Yeah, I just wanted to make a um, quick statement on, you know, it's been a pleasure working with you as the chairman of this subcommittee and you know, certainly the issues that you've taken on with regards to human rights and, and human dignity and, and looking for a, a better, more collaborative world. So I've appreciated your leadership on that and you know, I will try to take the baton and, and, and keep that going in, in the same direction and, and trajectory. So with that, I'll yield back. Just to, to, to echo the gentleman, echo the gentleman's, uh, 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 I'm supposed to say, associate myself with his words and his uh, his kind greeting. We are glad, as someone who serves on financial services, that uh, you'll be moving up the dais in that regard, and uh, we'll be sorely missed here. But we look forward to carrying on in your good stead. So we thank you. I thank you. <clears throat> We have four witnesses today. Two of them have been suggested by the minority party. Two of them have been selected by the majority party. There is so little partisanship on this effort. No one watching these hearings will be able to figure out which of the two witnesses Johan, uh, Yoho selected and which of the two the chairman selected. But the first witness I'll call on is uh, Adrian uh, Zenz, uh, is a former senior fellow in China Studies at the Victims of Communist Memorial uh, Foundation. He supervises PhD students at the uh, German-based uh, European uh, School of Culture and Theology. He has arguably done more than any academic to expose China's massive detention centers in Xinjiang and uh, the general oppression of the Uyghurs. Uh, please proceed, Doctor. I would like to thank you, Chairman and the Ranking Member and the others for inviting me to testify. In 2017, China's Xinjiang region embarked on the probably largest incarceration of an ethno-religious minority since the Holocaust. Now it is clear that this internment forms only the first phase of a long-term strategy of unprecedented and intrusive control. Beijing's long-term strategy in Xinjiang is being implemented under the heading and guise of poverty alleviation, notably industry-based poverty alleviation. I've identified three schemes of flows by which the state seeks to place the vast majority of minority adults into different forms of coercive or at least involuntary labor. Flow one pertains to persons in what I call vocational training internment camps, Camp detainees can end up in factories on internment camp compounds, in industrial parks, which can be located near camps or the camps in them, or vi village satellite factories. One document promised a participating company that 500 internment camp laborers would be brought to the facility with accompanying police guards. The employing companies receive 1,800 Chinese yuan state subsidy for each internment camp laborer they train 5,000 yuan for each they employ in a shipping cost subsidy of 4% of their sales volume. In 2018, Huafu Corporation, which operates the world's largest dyed yarn production in Xinjiang, received half a billion Chinese yuan, approximately 71 million US dollars, in subsidies from the Xinjiang government. Flow 2 pertains to a vast government scheme that puts hundreds of thousands of so-called rural surplus laborers into centralized training involving one month of military drill, one month of political thought indoctrination, and one month of vocational skills training. Workers are then sent off to their new work destination in large groups. Flow 3 places rural Uyghur women into village factories equipped with nurseries for infants as young as a few months old. Government village work teams use thought transformation to convince these women and their parents of the benefits of full-time factory labor. 
Government documents note that factory work transforms women away from tradition and backward thinking. One propaganda text states that this causes minority workers to become born again. The Chinese term for born again used here is the same as in the Chinese Bible, equating forced labor with salvation. Beijing is turning its internment campaign into a business of oppression, where participating companies benefit not only from government subsidies, and from, but also from cheap minority labor. As a result, they will be able to undercut global prices. A particular concern is that all of these labor flows are mixing beyond recognition. Graduates from internment camps work alongside workers from other flows. Products made by any combination of these workers are then exported or shipped to eastern China. As a result, many or most products made in China that rely at least in part on low-skilled labor-intensive manufacturing can contain elements of involuntary ethnic labor from Xinjiang. The Better Cotton Initiative, BCI, the world's largest cotton standard, which aims to promote, sustain, promote sustainability and better working conditions, recently stated that a continued presence and engagement in Xinjiang would continue to benefit local farmers. BCI states that there's no direct evidence that forced labor is being used on BCI licensed farms in Xinjiang. After Huafu, which is on the BCI Council, was scrutinized, BCI responded by noting that Huafu had commissioned an independent social audit which did not identify forced labor. Asking for an independent social audit in an environment as controlled as Xinjiang is like asking the fox to check that no hens are missing. My own research on Huafu comes to far more troubling conclusions. Over 90% of its staff are ethnic minorities, mostly rural surplus laborers. Huafu's website states that a large number of rural surplus laborers are idle at home, which brings hidden dangers to public security. Company reports depict hundreds of Uyghurs in military uniforms at a staff training event. And the Xinjiang government website reports that Huafu is part of an official training initiative where Uyghurs are put into centralized military drill, thought transformation, and de extremification Once employed, staff are subjected to intensive ongoing political indoctrination, including oath-swearing sessions and mandatory written reports designed to establish correct values. The German company Adidas audited Huafu's spinning facilities in Aksu and found, quote, no evidence of forced labor or of government involvement in the hiring of their workforce, end of quote. A cursory search shows Chinese media outlets citing Huafu's own management, openly saying that the local government sends us workers according our, to our staffing needs. A report from the Aksu government propaganda bureau confirms that the prefecture trains and then sends Uyghur workers to Huafu. Government reports that in that very region, as many as 200 adults from a single village were rounded up by government work teams and shipped off to work at factories. The third example pertains to garment maker H&M, which continues to procure yarn from Huafu, but from the yarn mills outside of Xinjiang. However, 19 provinces and cities in East Eastern China are mutually paired with minority regions in Xinjiang. This involves extensive state-mandated labor transfers. Government reports state that one county, county in Xinjiang alone sent 103 rural minority surplus laborers to Huafu's factory in Anhui province in Eastern China. I'm coming to a close here. In order to benefit from Beijing, in light of these present findings, I call upon the United States government to embark on a detailed investigation of policies and practices of involuntary labor in relation to Xinjiang and the involvement of American companies. After passing the Uyghur Human Rights Act, Act, stopping the business of oppression in Xinjiang is the next step. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now call upon uh, Ferkat uh, Jaudat, uh, who is a, a Uyghur American activist and software engineer. He immigrated to the United States in 2011 uh, with three of his siblings to live with his father who had immigrated in 2006. In February of 2018, uh, uh, Ferkat's uh, uh, mother was sent to an internment camp in Xinjiang um, along with uh, his, uh, along with uh, two younger uh, brothers and in-laws. Um, Farrakhan has been publicly advocating for his mother and her family and their release and has uh, met with Secretary Pompeo on that issue. Please proceed. I would like to thank Chairman Sherman and the Representative Yoho and then all the members of this committee for giving me the chance to share my story and be the voice of my people here today. I'm here to speak as an Uyghur American. 
subject to China's long arm of terror. I'm here to ask the Congress and the President to stand up for freedom. I came to the U.S. in 2011 with my three other siblings to reunite with my father who came here in 2006 and applied for political asylum. But my mother could not reunite with us because the Chinese government would not issue her a passport. We have exhausted all the legal channels to get her here. China holds her as hostage as leverage over us. On February 6, 2018, my mother left me her last message on WeChat, the Chinese version of WhatsApp. She told me she was going to the school. This is a code word that they use to describe the camps. Then she disappeared. A month later, five people from my father's side, they all wound up in one day and sent to one of those camps. I waited for more than seven months, praying my mother and relatives will be released. It was the darkest period of my life. I was desperate, I was scared, and I was nervous. Finally, I decided to speak out. Since September 2018, I have met many U.S. officials and gave interviews to more than 40 news outlets around the world. But as I worried and scared, each time I spoke out, my cousins, uncles, aunts, and even my 75 years old grandmother were threatened by the Chinese officials or the police. They were forced to sign documents stating that they will cut off all the contacts with me. Three days after I had a meeting with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in March this year, the, the Chinese police transferred my aunt and uncle to the prison, and later they sentenced them for seven and eight years for crimes that they never committed. After my story was published in the New York Times in May, I received a phone call from my mother. She told me she was released and begged me to stop criticizing China and speaking out. Three days later, I found that she was released only for one day to call me and she was surrounded by police officers and then brought back to the camp again the next day. After my mom became really ill in the camp, she was brought to a hospital. A Chinese, ethnic Chinese senior doctor told officials that the only way to keep my mother alive is to allow her to contact, having contact with her family members and get proper medical treatment. My mother was released in June, and we can now talk by phone, but she's in constant monitoring, and she's being visited by the Chinese police or the government officials every single day. She had to pose for the videos or pictures holding an apple or just pretending that she's drinking or eating at the house. Since my mother was released, the Chinese security agents contacted me twice on WeChat. They demanded that I listen to them and work with them in order to keep my mother safe. They hinted they could get her released to the U.S. if I cooperate with them. When I refused, they told me I should be ready to pay the price as I was going up against a global superpower. They told me I was worthless. I was powerless. The State Department issued a statement on November 5th calling on China to release the families of three Uyghur Americans and stop threatening us. Four days later, the Chinese government falsely branded me and Arafat Erkin, who is sitting here as an audience, as a member of the terrorist organization. And then they also released a video of our parents, our family members, where they say that they never been sent to the camps and that they are living happily. As a result of my testimony in this room today, China may release another video or another articles where they force my mom or my relatives to speak against my will. I worry about what will happen to my mother, and then especially after the, the New York Times podcast released yesterday, even before that, they already threatened that they can't just kill my mother if, that's been, if it's been published online. The U.S. government has led the world in responding to the Uyghur's nightmare. And then all the Uyghur Americans, including myself, my family members, we are really appreciated and then thankful for being a member of this great country. I also ask the Congress to pass the Uyghur Human Rights uh, Bill before the end of the year and to send it to the President's desk and urge him to sign it and let it become a law. 
I also asked the Congress to increase the funding for radiophysia, the Uyghur service, and then also provide more funding for the Uyghur organizations like Uyghur Human Rights Project and the Uyghur American Association. And for the last, I, as a son, I ask your help to bring my mother to the U.S. Thank you. Thank you. What you tell us is chilling and may justify the tariffs we have on Chinese goods, even if uh, we didn't have a trade dispute. Uh, now go on to uh, Joey uh, Siu, who is vice president of the City University of Hong Kong Students Association, is an active adca activist with the Hong Kong protesters. Ms. Siu uh, has organized peaceful protests including the assembly of 60,000 people calling for international support in August of this year. She has met with uh, over 60 political leaders from eight countries over the past three months and has testified uh, at the United Nations in Geneva. Ms. Siu. Good afternoon, Chairman, Chairman, Ranking Member Yoho, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for holding the hearing on the Human Rights Day. Today, when the free world countries celebrate the adoption of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. However, there is a totally different story under the Chinese authoritarian regime. Millions of people face severe oppression in their daily struggles to defend human rights. We Hong Kongers are one of them. And at this critical juncture, we are facing an unprecedented humanitarian crisis. Ever since the movement broke out on 9th of June, the crowd has not stopped taking to the streets for all 45 demands. The massive arbitrary arrest and political prosecutions have created a chilling effect on the rights to freedom of assembly and expression in Hong Kong. Police site of the Polytechnic University represents the most serious occasion of human rights violations Voluntary first aiders and journalists were arrested and forced to kneel with their hands tied, a scene which may not be visible even in war zones. Medical supplies, food and water supplies were cut off from the campus since then. The hygiene soon became a problem, and the desperate atmosphere was also traumatizing. The government created a humanitarian crisis in Hong Kong. On the most critical night, more than a thousand hundred Hong Kongers went onto the streets to rescue the trapped victims inside the Polytechnic University. But police responded with brutal suppression, resulting in a stampede. Until today, the police have fired around 10,000 tear gas canisters, 6,100 rubber bullets, and 19 life rounds. Although the police brutal arrest and dispersion tactics consist gross violations of the international human rights standards, they continue to enjoy impunity from the law and receive full support from the Chinese Communist government. In detention centers, detainees are often tortured and ill-treated, where access to legal assistance and medical supply is often denied. Victims have also reported sensual and gender-based violence committed by police officers. In a shocking case, a teenage girl filed a complaint against the police after allegedly raped inside the police station by multiple police officers. She even needed to undergo a determination of ensuing pregnancy. The pro-democracy camp's landslide victory in the district council election two, two weeks ago demonstrates Hong Kongers' overwhelming support for the five demands. Yet, we must bear in mind that candidates who advocate for independence or self-determination for Hong Kong are still deprived of the right to stand for elections. In 2016, Edward Lung, candidate representing Hong Kong indigenous, was barred from participating in the Legislative Council election. In, and in the same year, six elected lawmakers were, dis were dis disqualified. Edward Lung is now serving his six-year imprisonment of rioting, a crime under the Public Order Ordinance for his participation in the 2016 Hong Kong unrest. The vague terminology combined with the disproportional sentences allows the Hong Kong government to arbitrarily arrest and prosecute protesters. The ordinance has been repeatedly criticized by the United Nations for curtailing the freedom of assembly and expression. As the court hearings regarding the 2016 Hong Kong unrest continues, more than 6,000 politically motivated arrests have been made since June. As a result of political prosecution, Ray Wong and Ellen Lee, founders of Hong Kong Indigenous, fled Hong Kong in 2017 and were granted asylum status in Germany. They were the first two political refugees from Hong Kong 
and now we fear that the world is seeing more and more from Hong Kong. Freedom of press and academic freedom are also under threat. Major media companies have been brought by the by brought by the pro Beijing tycoons, resulting in serious censorship in news publications. Police unauthorized entries into the universities, accompanied by invasive use of force, severely encroach upon academic freedom. The government has installed a considerable amount of intelligence street lamps with high resolution security cameras across the city. Police force was also found to have used facial recognition technology to identify protesters since three years ago. The Chinese Communist government clearly has a plan to establish totalitarian control in Hong Kong. Having been turned into a police state, the city is not far from becoming a civilian state. The threat of Chinese interference not limited to Xinjiang, Tibet and Hong Kong. China has been exporting its surveillance technology, along with its model of totalitarian governance, to countries along the Belt and Road Initiative. Beijing's grand imperial project is posing a significant challenge to the rules-based order and democratic values across the world. We are grateful to the United States government for passing the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. The earlier the administration imposes sanctions on the perpetrators of human rights violations, the less human costs Hong Kongers need to suffer. We sincerely ask the United States government to lead all other democracies in the, in the world to ensure China complies with the international human rights standards. We ask urgently that the United States government to lead an international inquiry on Hong Kong police brutality against the Hong Kong people. We defend freedom and human rights, not only for ourselves, but also for the other people around the world. We need the United States and the other countries to stand with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, after we hear from the last witness, I'll call upon Mr. Vera, then uh, Mr. Yoho for uh, their questioning. And I'll, uh, earlier in my opening remarks, I uh, criticized uh, the President for not signing off on having UN hearings today on human rights in North Korea. But I should point out he did sign the legislation that we passed overwhelmingly in, uh, in the United States Congress on Hong Kong. With that, I'll rec recognize our last uh, witness, uh, Sophie Richardson, who is China Director at Human Rights Watch and is the author of numerous articles on domestic uh, Chinese political reform, democratization, and uh, human rights. She has testified before at the United States Senate, but much more importantly, at the House of Representatives. And uh, she's qualified to address not only the issues addressed by our other witnesses, namely uh, Hong Kong and uh, Xinjiang, but can also uh, enlighten us with regard to Tibet and the great Chinese heartland where human rights are also a concern. Ms. Richardson, Dr. Richardson. Uh, Chairman Sherman, Ranking Member Yoho, members of the subcommittee, uh, we wish we had better news to share with you with any of the many issues I've been asked to talk about today. Uh, but from the 156th self-immolation last week of a Tibetan to more than 10,000 rounds of tear gas fired at largely peaceful protests in Hong Kong, from the one million plus arbitrarily detained Uyghurs who, contrary to party officials' claims that they have, quote, graduated, are clearly not free, uh, to authorities crushing independent civil society and peaceful dissent, partly through pervasive state surveillance, including the social credit system, uh, the realities are at best challenging. Uh, in addition, Chinese government threats to human rights no longer stay within China's borders. They range from undermining norms like academic freedom at universities in the U.S. to undermining key institutions like the U.N.'s Human Rights Council. Um, I'd like to spend my time today talking through a couple of different areas of recommendations. Uh, I hope that's, that's acceptable to you. The first is about multilateralism specifically with a view towards accountability. We've got a lot of evidence of grave human rights violations in Xinjiang. We're good on that. What we need uh, is to combat China's power in the international system and particularly within the UN, which is effectively blocking many of the different pathways to accountability. Let's recall today the proceedings began this morning in The Hague against the Myanmar government for its gross violations of Rohingya's human rights. We have to imagine the same outcome for the family members of all these people who are sitting here with photographs. The United States has found ways to support some of the efforts related to Xinjiang uh, at the Human Rights Council and at the General Assembly in New York, but the reality is that the U.S. not being a member of the Human Rights Council has hampered those efforts 
it has ceded that institution to greater Chinese influence, and it's made that institution that much more difficult to access for independent civil society from China. So quite simply, if we have any expectations that the Chinese government is going to be held to the same standards as any other government in the world, the U.S. has to be a robust, principled, consistent, reliable player there. So that's one area we can talk about. Um, with respect to uh, sanctions and export controls, we certainly share uh, your views about global Magnitsky, global Magnitsky sanctions that are appropriate for multiple China uh, situations. The ad I think the administration's willingness to use that tool just in the last day or two with Cambodia and Myanmar, uh, but not in China, has not escaped Beijing's attention. Um, we are encouraged by the Department of Commerce's additions uh, to the, uh, of the Xinjiang Public Security Bureau, particularly to the entities list. We also encourage a scrutiny of CETC, which is the conglomerate that's responsible for building the integrated joint operations platform, which is sort of the central brain of high-tech surveillance in Xinjiang. Uh, we particularly appreciate the current uh, Uyghur Act's uh, approach to export, re-export, and in-country transfers, that it focuses on the potential threats to human rights rather than a specific technology or a specific company. Because that matches the grim reality today in China, which is that authorities don't necessarily want things like handcuffs or tasers to commit human rights abuses. They want things like DNA sequencers. And U.S. legislation needs to catch up to that reality. Um, third, with respect to pending uh, legislation, we are certainly broadly supportive both of the Tibet uh, po the Tibet Support Policy Act and the Uyghur Act um, and encourage uh, the Senate to take those up quickly and pass them. Um, one other area I, I want members to think about is ensuring that U.S. companies, universities, and other institutions aren't part of the problem. <laughs> uh, I think this committee can certainly do a lot of work in urging any U.S. company that has a presence in Tibet or Xinjiang to publish its due diligence strategy to show that it has thought through the human rights risks to doing business in those regions. On a related note, we would certainly urge very close scrutiny uh, of any assessments that claim they have unfettered access to supply chains. As, as Professor Jones has pointed out, this is a very difficult region to independently assess much of anything. Uh, but U.S. universities, I think, also need to be pushed to ensure that they are taking all possible steps to mitigate clear Chinese government threats to academic freedom on campuses. I'm happy to elaborate on the work that we've done uh, setting out steps that schools can take to challenge these kinds of threats. Uh, we've sent it to all 50 U.S. Uh, state university systems. Relatively few have replied at all. None of them, I would say, have replied thoughtfully to show that they're taking these concerns seriously. Last but not least, it's imperative that the U.S. continue to support independent civil society in China. The Chinese government's foreign NGO management law has made that considerably more difficult. We have confidence that the U.S. can be nimble and thoughtful and agile for, and keep supporting the people inside China who are really trying to make change. Uh, we also hope the U.S. is actively tracking and vigorously pushing Chinese authorities over uh, those authorities' harassment of family members inside China uh, for the activism of people outside China. So I think combining these different elements uh, makes for the most successful possible human rights dialogue between people in the U.S. and in China, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Mr. Biro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this important hearing, and thank you to the, the witnesses for having the courage um, at some risk to, to step up and, and share the stories. It's uh, incredibly Im important, um, and to have a platform such, such as this. You know, when I think about my introduction to, to activism, it was as a young college student in the, the apartheid movement in the early 80s and, and, and so forth, and it almost as though we've got to create uh, public awareness and a similar movement to um, build on what I hope are, you know, our core values as the United States of America of, of human rights and, and, and human decency and not sit silent. Um, Dr. Richardson, you might have the best perspective on this. Obviously, China controls the flow of information with, within China, you know, information from Hong Kong, information from Xinjiang. Um, how much does the rest of the Chinese domestic population know what's happening within their own borders? Well, it, uh, getting out that kind of information requires a couple of things. First, access to a really good VPN, uh, which has gotten much harder, but, but it also requires knowing to ask, knowing enough to go looking. 
And if you have been told all your life that you know, Xinjiang is a hotbed of terrorism and therefore Chinese government policies in the region are justified, and you've never had the opportunity to second guess that or give, been given reason to do that, you're probably not going to. Uh, and you know, some of my colleagues speak very eloquently about the very jarring reality of, for example, leaving the country to come to school, for example, in the US and being confronted with a completely different set of facts and not and going through the process of understanding not just that what you've been taught all of your life is, is at best questionable, if not you know, completely fictitious, but then the process of relearning and understanding how you can actually give credence to certain kinds of information. It's very challenging on many levels. And what tools do we have, say, in the, the multilateral Western world to get information into China? about well, potentially what's going on. I think on. that ranges everywhere from you know, anti-circumvention technology, uh, or I should say pro-circumvention technology, to you know, the, the wonderful work that's done by different services like DOA and RFA. I think keeping the doors open to students and to scholars who want to come to the United States <laughs> is critical, and treating that, treating that impulse as, as an opportunity for solidarity rather than just a national security issue, which is really how it's been discussed here for the last year. Uh, I think those are all important ways of giving people access to alternative inf narratives and information. You touched on the role of U.S. Um, the US corporate sector as well as academic institutions, and certainly, um, again, going back to, to my introduction in the early 80s, you know, some of that was putting pressure on the U.S. corporate sector as well as the U.S. academic sector. At, at this juncture, do you see much of that happening at the grassroots level? or? you know, from a state-by-state state perspective, or is it still very early? I would say that it's very fragmented, um, and I think there are very different discussions about the involvement of companies uh, and the kinds of due diligence standards that they're expected to uphold. I think the discussion for and about universities uh, is different, which is not necessarily to say that some of them aren't just as problematic in their relationships, but I think they have a different set of responsibilities and obligations um, I think universities are really struggling to understand the scope uh, of threats to academic freedom that stem from Chinese government pressure. They seem to think, for the most part, that uh, you know, unless a Chinese diplomat is, for example, telling them they can't have, you know, telling a senior level administrator that they can't have a particular event on campus, that there aren't problems. You know, they aren't they aren't looking at examples like at the UC Davis campus a couple of weeks ago. You know, students rip, pro Beijing students ripping down Lenin walls and other pro democracy uh, Hong Kong materials. You know, and the school isn't proactively saying, in a very broad sense, you can't do that and taking a stand on issues like that. Some of it is very sort of micro level uh, awareness that big institutions, I think, are struggling to get their heads around. So, probably, you know, one thing that definitely is within our control here in the U.S. domestically is to raise that awareness to to make sure proper information is getting out to the kind of the U.S. corporate social responsibility community um, and, and certainly to, to the big academic institutions and, and you know, th that flow of information getting out there. And again, um, not going to be easy, but certainly I think is incredibly important to, to create both a, a, a grassroots um, movement. You know, the one last question, um, kind of on the multilateralism where um, Western democracies, countries that share similar values of openness and human rights, um, we haven't heard as much of th that kind of multilateral coalition coming together to exert pressure or exert economic pressure. And are you seeing some of that coming together? Or or I guess maybe I have a bit of a different view on that. I mean, that, that 25 governments, not including the United States. <laughs> and maybe that's the perspective that so came together in uh, July to offer up the first serious criticism via the Human Rights Council president about Xinjiang calling for access. And, and, and maybe playing off of that, how diminished is our role by not being part of the UN human rights community right now? Well, it's about being part of the Human Rights Council particularly, but it, you know, I can't in five seconds answer. It, it's, it is enormously problematic. Other governments want the U.S. leadership. They want the air cover. 
Thank, uh, thank you. Great. Thank you. I yield back. Now recognize the gentlelady from Missouri. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the ranking member um, allowing me to jump ahead here. The New York Times recently published hundreds of pages of leaked party documents relating to repression of the Uyghurs. Some seem to suggest that the rampant human rights abuses in Xinjiang have had caused rifts in party leadership. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jadat, how significant are these dissenting voices and how can the United States leverage in, in, in internal disagreement to blunt Beijing's uh, attack on the Uyghur Muslims? So for that question, I think before like we come to the question part, like it's really important to know that the documents were released by someone inside the party. Right. And then he or she stated that the reason that he risked his or her life to publish the documents is to get Xi Jinping and then the party officials in front of the justice. So we have to get the signal. And then the world was waiting for a document or proof or evidence like for years, but now we got we got the hard proof. It is coming directly from the Xi Jinping himself. And then there is disagreements between the Communist Party about what to do, how to suppress the Uyghurs. But it is really good to see that there is at least some people in the Chinese government, the ethnic Chinese officials, that they are trying or saying no to the Xi Jinping's order. Well, I hope we can continue to leverage a little bit of that internal uh, dissent, and it is up to us to give voice. I thank you for your courage um, and all thank that you. you have endured. Uh, more than a year ago, in a controversial bid to insulate Chinese Catholics from persecution and intimidation, the Vatican signed a deal with the Chinese government allowing it a role in appointing Catholic bishops in China. In the meantime, China has launched a, a sinicization campaign to dilute the religious, ethnic, and cultural <laughs> identities of minority groups. Dr. Richardson, uh, how is sinicization affecting Chinese Catholic communities, both state-sanctioned and underground, uh, and how has the Vatican responded? Sinicization means being loyal to the party and the government above anything It's an amazing else. word, isn't it? Yes. And it's a little hard to reconcile with the concept of the freedom to believe. Correct. <laughs> since one rather does seem to replace the other. You know, and so the problems that we're seeing as a result of the sinicization campaign aren't unique to people who are worshiping in state-sanctioned Catholic churches versus underground ones. This is, this is relevant to Tibetan Buddhists. It's relevant across different faith communities. Um, it is hard to see much of a consequential response whatsoever uh, from the Vatican. Uh, there was a Global Times story this morning that I believe suggested <coughs> that the, the, the Pope had China and the Chinese people central to his heart. Uh, it's uh -huh. up to the Vatican to say whether that's accurate. Uh, but negotiations seem to be proceeding uh, between the two about uh, s the selection of bishops. Well, as a cradle Catholic, I believe that it is incumbent upon the Vatican to call this sinicization uh, uh, campaign out, especially given the agreement that they have um, undertaken with the Catholic bishops uh, in, in China. And I would, I would very vociferously call on that um, here. China is in the process of assembling and implementing a, a dys dystopian social credit system that uses data mining and surveillance to score citizens, to score citizens based on their, quote, trustworthiness. I understand China plans to deploy a similar system now to track businesses operating in China. Dr. Richardson, again, what is the status of the corporate social credit system and how do you anticipate it will be used to coerce and intimidate foreign actors? The most recent development was about three months ago when Chinese authorities announced that they were going to use the, the social credit system or that they were going to apply the corporate version of it, not just to domestic companies, but to foreign ones as well. I can only assume that our collective social credit scores are pretty low at the moment. Um, 
you know, it's, it is very difficult to tell just how integrated across the country these systems are. And at the moment, from our perspective, they appear designed to reward or induce particular kinds of behavior. It's not exactly clear what sorts of punishments you know, will follow uh, for having a low score. We know that if you've got a good score, for example, you're more likely to be able to enroll your child in the school that you want, or you won't have problems doing things like buying plane tickets or accessing state services. But if you have a low score, you can run into problems. And of course, you know, in a normal world, this might just be sort of a consumer rating system, maybe. <laughs> but we're talking about an environment in which you know, the law is whatever the Chinese Communist Party says it is when it says it is that. And there's no right to privacy and there's no way for people to know fully how they're being rated, what the consequences are. It's an entirely arbitrary system. And in a, in a way, I think to the extent some people inside China have expressed enthusiasm for this idea, that's as much a commentary on how politicized and corrupt the legal system is in not being able to deliver you know, consistent verdicts about what behavior that's been codified by law. The repression, the repression and the brainwashing is uh, uh, significant. My time has expired. I want to thank you all for being here, for your courage, and everyone who sits behind you know that this Congress and this, uh, this committee care deeply uh, about bringing light to this process uh, and this uh, disgraceful humanitarian uh, regime. So I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, Dr. Richardson, um, when the Chinese diplomats were in my office, they denied the social s uh, scoring system even existed. Do organs of the uh, Chinese government at least admit that this is happening, or do they consistently deny? Or is it like they deny on Mondays and admit it on Tuesdays? Well, I mean, let's recall that this is the government that denied for a year was arbitrarily detaining any Uyghurs, and right. then, you know, under but, the but, but is the Chinese government on record as saying they're developing a social system, or do they, a social scoring system, or do they try to deny it constantly? You know, some parts of the government have publicly acknowledged the social credit system, mostly at the municipal level, governments that are using it, uh, you know, for access to local public services, but no, there's, and there's evidence out there. And Not a problem. they claim that They'll lower their tariffs, we'll lower ours, and we'll have fair trade. Um, can this system uh, be used to punish either individuals or companies that choose to buy products uh, or services from the United States when they could have bought them uh, uh, from Chinese uh, uh, companies? I don't think we have any information to answer that question yet, so I, I guess I would default to a more general observation that okay, we, we it's do arbitrary. Right. right, and the, we do know that uh, it is the uh, position of the Chinese government buy the Chinese products, and that's one of the reasons why we have an enor the world's the largest trade deficit in history uh, with uh, China. The World Bank is supposed to be helping countries that are trying to develop. Uh, we had Mnuchin uh, come before uh, uh, the Financial Services Committee and think it was a great victory that China was only going to get a billion dollars, turns out it's closer to two billion, of concessionary loans from the World Bank, including our money. Um, but it particularly troubles me in light of this hearing. I'm told that the World Bank currently funds several vocational schools in Xinjiang. Um, does the World Bank have the capacity to make sure that those schools are not part of this incarceration uh, slash retraining system? Mr. John, Mr. Jada. I just, I just wanted to add, like, t as a comment, like, uh, to your question as well. Like, you said it's that more than billion dollar. Some part is from our money. That some part is coming from my tax in the U.S. that I am making. I am paying for the government, mm -hmm. and then it is being used to put my mom in the camp. Um why the U.S. government hasn't drawn a line about our participation in the World Bank and demanded a zero approach to uh, subsidizing the Chinese government is something I addressed to Mr. Mnuchin and you may want to address to uh, the administration as well. Um, I know the State Department is not represented here at this hearing, but uh, is the United States doing all we can to get our diplomats and to get nonprofit, uh, rather non-governmental organizations uh, access uh, to Xinjiang. Uh, 
Does anyone know? I'm I don't even think. know if we're even trying. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Richardson. Yeah, I, 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 think it, I think it's a little bit different for diplomats and for NGOs. Um, I certainly wouldn't object to the State Department being more adventurous at actually trying to send I diplomats. Cer I to certainly the haven't read any report of I any anybody making it uh, from our embassy in Beijing uh, oh. out to Western China. Yeah, I, I think they. I think their calculation is that they would be so heavily surveilled, they would be turned around on arrival, and that look, that's the reality. That would happen. But I think at this point, the U.S. should be considering, for example, stating uh, stating explicitly that it is pursuing consular cases. There are plenty of U.S. citizens and legal permanent residents who have family members right. who have been detained. Right. I see no reason why the State Department couldn't be more aggressive in trying to visit the region to try with the explicit stated purpose of trying to visit those family members, even if they do get turned back. Let that be reported. Exactly. And I would point out that Chinese diplomats fly around our country as they will. Um, what can the United States do to ensure that Americans are not purchasing goods made uh, with forced labor? I think uh, the United States government is uh, becoming aware of the issue slowly. Um, I have done my part in this. Um, the problem is the forced labor situation is very complex and very complicated. It does not just involve internment camp labor, it involves involuntary training putting women into small-scale village factories and transferring minorities to work in participating larger corporations in eastern China. And that's one of the examples I gave in my testimony. And so the problem is there's a lack of understanding and awareness, especially of the cross-linkages between Xinjiang and eastern China. And um, I think it'd be very good if the United States government, for example, sent a strong signal a strong message of concern to the business community because my impression is that the business community is um, just really trying to get away with whatever they can as we have seen in recent weeks. I'm going to sneak in one question quickly because I don't know if anybody has an answer. Do any of you have the, a view as to why the Trump administration has not used the global Magnitsky sanctions on a single Chinese official, not even the party secretary for Xinjiang? Well, let the record show no I one could no one could answer the <coughs> question. Uh, I have heard Dr. through the grapevine that the Treasury Department, uh, and this is not my personal observation, but I've it's it's been heard through, it's been rumored through several grapevines. Let's put it that way, and it's become almost maybe public knowledge that um, the Treasury, which is yeah primarily of course responsible for. Um, agreeing to the Magnitsky um, did not in any way want human rights, these uh, human rights considerations in Xinjiang to impact the trade uh, negotiations, so prioritizing the trade negotiations. One would hope that people would read the statute and realize you cannot ignore human rights statutes even if you think that's achieving another purpose. With uh, that, I'll recognize the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate everybody's testimony. and. Um, I think it all comes down to the money, and I'm going to address that later. But first off, I want to say how blessed I am to have been born in America, to live in this country. Because I, and, and I, I feel guilty for not appreciating it every day. But when I see you holding up signs and pictures of your family members, how fleeting freedom is and how fortunate we are in this country. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for braving coming out in public. And I'm gonna ask the audience again, of the members that of, of your family that have been picked up um, and sent so-called to the re-education camps, how many of those did that free will? I see no hands, so I would say none. How many were gainfully employed and law-abiding citizens before they got picked up? How many? Your mother was? Anybody else? All the pictures here, these people had jobs. They were working. They were lawfully employed. Law-abiding citizens. How many of them were deemed terrorists or were troublemakers? 
That's what we know. Yet China says it's for their own good. We've talked to other members from Xinjiang, pharmacists, accountants, doctors, that were just living their life, and they had a belief, a religious belief. And I wanted to say to Ambassador Wagner that the Pope is going to have some explaining to do when he meets uh, up at the pearly gates of St. Peter's that he has put God under the Chinese Communist Party because China said that there is no God. Dr. Richardson, you brought out, uh, you talked about, can you send this committee and my office the letter you sent to the 50 universities? I would help, like to help you have a follow-up with that because I want that answer too because we've asked that. Uh, we can't dictate to China. We can't force China to do anything. The message we need to send to China is, and to our manufacturers is to institute what we have deemed the ABC policy in manufacturing, and that is called manufacture anywhere but China because it's about the money. The only thing that allows China to do what they are doing is because of the money. They have cornered the market on the rare earth metals. They have cornered the market 100% of the vitamins and minerals that go into our livestock feed. They control 85 to 90% of the APIs, which are the uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, and the list goes on and on and on. And so we can't force them to do anything, but we sure can put pu public pressure on our manufacturers. We can put public pressure on the NBA, and it makes me sick that they come out in defense of China, but yet they're actively supporting a government that is actively suppressing the people. And it's just not the people of China, it's what we see in Hong Kong. And thank you for standing up and doing what you do, Joey. I have followed you and this uh, protest over the weekend. You know, I want you to know that it's not going on notice. It's noticed here in the United States of America. It's noticed around the world. And as the uh, chairman said, the more you can do it peacefully, the stronger the message is. Because China can't, they don't know how to deal with freedom of thought. Because you don't honor the Chinese Communist Party on a pedestal and bow down to it. Because that's not the way we're designed. But you know what we can do? is when I, I went shopping this weekend to do some projects around the home, and I had to buy something so it was made in China. I put it back, and I looked until I found something. It was made in the country of Taiwan. I paid $1.50, two more, maybe extra for it, and I'm happy to support the country of Taiwan over supporting a communist regime that I know is not looking out for humans uh, and human rights. And so that's what we can do individually as people. And if enough of us do that, that message gets over there clear. And I think with um, the people releasing those 400 pages, I think that's awesome. And that person should get the Nobel Peace Prize when this all settles. Because these people on, this is what we're fighting. The suppression of people that have normal family lives. It's just because they choose to have a religion that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't agree with. We've seen this in Tibet. We've seen the erosion of the Tibetan culture. Uh, the Chinese government has put drugs in there to dilute that, uh, that society. They're doing it in Xinjiang. They want to do it in Hong Kong. Who's next? When I first took over the chairman, if you don't mind me, Mr. Chairman, but when I first took over the chairmanship last Congress of this committee, we had a meeting with the country of Taiwan. My office staff, one of them's right here, said that the Chinese ambassadors called them, says, we don't want your member to have that meeting. Can you imagine that? I'm a sitting member of the U.S. Congress, and I'm getting a call from, the ambas from Ch China, says, you can't have that meeting. I told them, mind their own business. I'll meet with whomever I want to. I was in the country of Chile with a congressman down there. His brother had received two ambulances from the country of China. His brother is a mayor in a town. The congressman was having a meeting with the country of Taiwan. China told him, if your brother has that meeting with Taiwan, you will not get any more ambulances. That's the kind of reach they have. Dr. Richardson, you brought up the effect on our educational system. You obviously saw what was going on in Canada over the weekend and last week. Uh, Pro-Beijing people were demonstrating 
and causing conflict with the people that stood up for the human rights uh, and the people standing up in Hong Kong. This is something we, as people of free societies, can and will and will stand together to make this come to an end. I don't want to buy anything from China. When they start acting properly, maybe they'll have to sing Amazing Grace or something. I don't know what it is. But then we'll treat them as normal. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and thank you for your time. Uh, gen uh, recognize the gentlelady from uh, Nevada. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I realize that today's committee is uh, hearing is about um, the egregious abuses by China of human rights, but it goes much further than that. This is more than just bilateral relations between China and the U.S. It's a multinational, and it certainly is a regional problem. I would ask Dr. Richardson if we could pick up where Ami Barra left off. Seems to be there's a double dilemma here. On the one hand, the U.S. is conceding its leadership role in the protection of human rights. I think that's international, but certainly it's an example is China. On the other hand, China is in a position where it can exert uh, economic and security pressures on certain countries. So when we tell them, you know, do as I say, not as I do, but you have to do this or we'll put sanctions, how are they going to balance their attempts to protect human rights with that pressure that they're receiving from China? And what can we do to try to intercede there to be a player again? I think that's sort of the $64,000 question of our time. Uh, you know, it, I think first the U.S. has to make sure that it is itself fully compliant <laughs> and you know, behaving in accordance with established international human rights law. Uh, I would refer you to my colleagues who work on the U.S. to speak more specifically to some of those issues. But you know, I think the U.S. has been slow to recognize and respond to the ways that, the many different ways that the Chinese government and Communist Party uh, you know, have moved into all different spaces uh, of international relations. It's not just about you know, U.S. development assistance competing with, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, you know, there are very complex discussions about the use of technology and who's going to set and defend uh, international standards on things like privacy rights uh, or who owns certain kinds of technology and can deploy that. Uh, you know, there are a lot of different areas where I think the U.S. has some catching up to do uh, in crafting policies that are consistent with international human rights standards, but also you know, offer compelling alternatives to countries that are increasingly dependent on Chinese government money. One example I think of is the <coughs> the overwhelming passage of the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act from the House. Like right after that, the Australia and then the EU yesterday, they implemented their own magnesty sanctions for the human rights abusers. So even before the, that bill becomes a law, there is already enough momentum around the globe that other countries are following the US steps. So it is really like many, th many great things start from here. So. Once that bill becomes a law, it is really great chance for other countries to really stand up, and then it will give U.S. another like all uh, alliance, and then another power to go after the China. The biggest problem: Chinese are very good in strategy, and they have always been for a long time. And they know that you uh, pick countries out one by one. So the strategy is to isolate and do bilateral. The approach to contain China's human rights violation that we need to take must be multilateral. And China, knowing that, has uh, moved to paralyze and co-opt the few multilateral uh, institutions that we actually have. And that, I think, is the number one problem that we are facing and that must be recognized. And I'm not sure where the right solution even starts. But uh, I think that is the key problem, and a lot of countries are afraid to counter China very directly. I mean, look at Sweden. I mean, they just took a Swedish citizen, you know, in front of diplomats and put him, go in high and put him in prison. Yes, he's ethnic Chinese, so they think he's, he's one of them, no matter what his passport is. And Sweden's not even publicly doing anything about it. And then the, uh, the, the Chinese ambassador to Sweden regularly lashes out at the media and everything, and then one of the Swedish uh, ministers 
was going to attend a ceremony on be to, to honor or commemorate or something Guo Minhai, the detained citizen. And then Chinese ambassador to Sweden threatened that if the minister would attend, that she would get on a blacklist, a Chinese blacklist. Um, if, if I was head of Sweden, I mean, I, I would s not just say something, but I would say something strong. And I have no idea what these people do and how they think that they can get pushed around. But I think this is more than ridiculous. And it's amazing it's even gotten this far. trade war and then try to resolve it and make that the priority as opposed to human rights. That's the kind of results that you get here in this country. If, if we seem to be afraid to stand up as well. That's the problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, for the record, if China's watching, I hope you put me on the blacklist. I would be honored. I'll be with you. Good. <laughs> and Mr. Yoho, too. Uh, I, for the record, I want to apologize for not calling on the gentleman from Michigan first, and I will call on uh, Ms. Spangmaker for uh, uh, her questions, and uh, we'll see if the gentleman from Michigan uh, makes it back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to our witnesses, thank you for being here today. To all of the families who are present, thank you for your continued activism. Thank you for being here with photographs. Thank you for reminding members of Congress what exactly it is that you're working for. Um, and I see my colleague has just entered. Okay, I'll continue. Thank you to my colleague from Michigan. Um, Dr. Richardson, my question is for you. In your opening statement, you said something to the effect of to commit human rights offenses, China doesn't need handcuffs. Uh, they need DNA sequences, or they will be using DNA sequences. And through artificial intelligence and the use of more than 200 surveillance cameras, China is developing the capability to conduct widespread surveillance and enforce social control. These capabilities, specifically the use of biometrics, facial, voice, iris, and gate recognition software, and pervasive video monitoring, are being used extensively in Xinjiang to identify individuals who Chinese authorities consider threatening. I am concerned about China's development of artificial intelligence surveillance technology, but I'm also very concerned about reports that China is exporting this technology to other countries for their potentially repressive purposes. How can policymakers prevent U.S. actors from contributing either through the provision of capital or technology to the construction of the Chinese government's surveillance networks? It's a big question. I mean, the first p key piece clearly is knowing who is selling what uh, and how that technology is being used. I mean, the, the nearly two-year-long conversation that we had with Thermo Fisher Scientific, a Massachusetts-based uh, technology firm, revolved largely around the fact that they were extremely reluctant to acknowledge the possibility that their technology might be used in a really nasty way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I think the conversation really has to start with understanding what technology is being sold and to whom and how it's actually being used. And the reference to handcuffs was that the, the sanctions that went into a f that the U.S. imposed after Tiananmen, which have weakened considerably, were largely about crowd control or police equipment. But what hasn't kept up is U.S. legislation that responds to what Chinese police are now using as tools of repression. It's a very different set of equipment. Uh, so I think you know, the relevant committees really need to look at who's selling what to whom, uh, especially in light of you know, the addition of the Xinjiang Public Security Bureau to the entities list and the greater focus on some of the Chinese tech companies. We actually wrote in 2014 about uh, the ZTE selling mm -hmm. voice recognition software to the Ethiopian government, which was at the time using that equipment to surveil conversations by the political opposition. You know, this is knowable information. Uh, and, you know, some of us are working in different ways on gathering some of it, but presumably Congress has resources at its disposal, you know, to do a broader survey. But I think one piece of this I would encourage you to focus on that hasn't gotten uh, as much attention as we think it should is also the role of sort of research and development and some academics and institutions in working with Chinese public security research institutes. Such things exist. Uh, and there's actually been an alarming amount of collaboration between uh, foreign experts and those institutions with a view towards refining technology. Last but not least, um, 
it's concerning to us that there is ongoing cooperation between some of the companies that are now on the entities list and U.S. universities. MIT's flagship computer science laboratory has an ongoing partnership with iFlyTech. Uh, you know, I don't quite understand how that works now that iFlyTech is on the entities list, uh, but in the same way that we need to look at what universities are doing with respect to academic freedom, I think there's also room to look at what they're doing in terms of collaboration with some of these kinds of companies. Thank you very much. And I, Mr. Chairman, I don't have a timer, so I think I'm running short, but I want to thank the, the, the witnesses, uh, and I yield back. Thank you. Yield uh, as much time as he may consume to the, uh, uh, the uh, very patient gentleman from Michigan who I should have called on earlier. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate you on your outstanding leadership of this uh, subcommittee. I don't know if this is the last hearing uh, you, uh, you preside over before you move on to other, uh, other leadership duties, but I really want to thank you personally for your great work here. Um, and I want to uh, say to, uh, on, on this Human Rights Day, uh, we could uh, sadly spend days of hearings on different human rights problems uh, in China, the surveillance state and, and, and their sort of global reach on those issues which we were just uh, talking about, um, the situation uh, in Xinjiang, and I, I give a shout out to all of our Uyghur brothers and sisters. We see you, we hear you, we are gonna fight for you uh, no matter what it takes until we can take apart this uh, repressive uh, gulag, really, that exists um, in Xinjiang. Um, and in Hong Kong, uh, Ms. Su, I was in Hong Kong in May, late May of uh, 1989, uh, when million, over a million people took to the streets in the democracy movement, and I just salute your uh, brave activism uh, there. Uh, but later in that summer, I went on to uh, Chengdu and uh, trying to get into uh, Tibet, and I want to focus my, my uh, questions on, on the situation in Tibet. Um, on my way, I, I wasn't able, Tibet was closed in 1989, and I was in Chengdu during the Tiananmen Massacre, and that's a whole other story. But anyway, um, on the way home, I was a, I was a graduate student in Tibetan uh, philosophy, and I, on my way home, I interviewed the Dalai Lama in Los Angeles. And um, then a couple months later, um, 30 years ago today, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. 30 years ago today. And it's very sad to see what's happened to the Tibetan nation uh, since then. Um, so, um, Dr. Richardson, I, one problem is that U.S. policymakers uh, have little access to um, the Tibet Autonomous Region, and they've been denied access to it. The United States has requested permission to open a consulate in Lhasa and been uh, repeatedly denied. Uh, what should the U.S. do about this? Should we prohibit China from opening up any new consulates here until the Chinese party allows us to open a consulate in, in Lhasa? I mean, how, how can we monitor human rights there or support the Tibetan people there if we, don't, if we aren't there? Well, I mean, first of all, I think that's a reasonable strategy to try. Uh, you know, doing good research on human rights violations in Tibet is extremely challenging, and I would say that it's maybe one of the only things that has prepared us for some of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years on Xinjiang, um, where one has to be incredibly patient <laughs> and puzzle pieces of information together. The information flows have narrowed considerably, particularly as there are greater restrictions on Tibetan language social media and Tibetans' access to social media. Right. The numbers of Tibetans leaving the region uh, have plummeted. You know, the numbers of people who used to come out through Nepal are right. a tiny fraction of what they were 10 years ago. And it's much more difficult for people to get into the region. That said, human beings are creative in how they manage to get information out. Uh, we've been doing some work on access to bilingual education, which is not <laughs> bilingual. Uh, and have actually managed through various channels to obtain some testimonies you know, that speak to what's happening in the region. We encourage anybody who's, who's able to do that kind of work and share those stories safely uh, to do so. I think the U.S. has resources to know what's happening in the region. Uh, it'd be good if it was a little bit more vocal 
of thousands. Right. Well, that's a whole another matter we may or may not have time to get to. But let's talk about the um, the whole question of, of the succession of the Dalai Lama. The 14th Dalai Lama has said that uh, he alone has the legitimate authority to um, about where and how he would be reincarnated. Um, and but ch you know China signaled its intention to control the pro process. Of course, we have the famous situation with the Panchen Lama, who they said they picked their own, and then he's, he and his parents have never been seen since. Um, I just want to emphasize that, you know, all Tibet has four major, there are four major sects of Tibetan Buddhism, and they all have many reincarnate lamas. And the Dalai Lama sect, which has been for a long time the sort of politically most powerful, would never dream of telling the Sakyas or the Kagyus or whatever who their reincarnate lamas are. I mean, there's no, it's, it's a completely, it's a question of religious freedom and they think, you know, actually, you know, they believe that this is actually a, a, a reincarnation process. So you, a government can't pick someone. So it's a, especially shocking. But what is, what do you think uh, we can do uh, I mean, what do you see as the outcome of this dispute, given what's happened with the Panchen Lama and the wildly higher stakes um, of the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama? What's going to happen here? Well, I think one succinct answer is to say that any Dalai Lama chosen by Beijing will be completely devoid of any legitimacy, both in a, a spiritual or religious sense, but also in, I think, a diplomatic and political sense. You know, it, it is painfully clear, both by basic human logic <laughs> and international law, that the right to make those decisions pertains solely to the community that's affected by them. And I think one of the best aspects of the legislation that's under consideration is making that view unambiguously the United States government. Policy of the United States. And I think yeah. going out and, you know, making common cause with like-minded governments on that position will be helpful. So how long have you been doing human rights work for Human Rights Watch or otherwise? Uh, I joined Human Rights Watch in February of 2006. So can you comment on the weight that the Trump administration has given human rights in vis-a-vis -vis other aspects of foreign trade, military policy, U.S. national security, um, in, in terms of your experience with the Obama and the George W. Bush administrations? With China in general, and not just Tibet. In 15 seconds? No, uh, no. <laughs> my chairman was good enough to <laughs> give us, so okay. when you my time uh, will expire whenever you're done, you have as long as you wish. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but then it will expire. Uh, be careful what you offer. Um, I think the Trump administration's much more aggressive posture towards China is a very welcome change. We've been saying for over a decade, this is a government that presents a serious threat, not just to the 1.4 billion people inside China, but to the world. And while you know, President Trump's loathsome remarks about President Xi as his best friend or that he is a brilliant guy or these sorts of things are, I think, deeply problematic because they, uh, they allow the Chinese leadership to choose which version is actually U.S. policy. Uh, I think the Trump administration gets credit for doing things like, you know, trying to find, uh, you know, solutions or support for people in the community here who are being harassed, uh, for speaking relentlessly about religious freedom. Uh, you know, the rhetoric has been good. Uh, look, it, you know, that, that we've seen additions to the entities list. I mean, these are not, these are not small steps mm -hmm. to take. Uh, and I suspect that, you know, U.S.-China policy will never be quite the same again, which is as much a function of the Chinese government's aggression and its terrible track record on human rights issues. But I think uh, U.S. policymakers across the spectrum are much more, not just clear-eyed, I don't mean to suggest that people in the past didn't understand this, but I think people are much more focused on what the stakes are and what steps they need to take now to ensure that there's actually some accountability and some way of pushing back against Beijing's encroachments, not just on rights, but on other issues too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Rather than adjourn, I'm going to ask one question of Ms. Siu because I don't believe you've been asked a question. Um, and 
On November 24th, Hong Kong held elections for district council. A record 4.13 uh, million people registered to vote. Almost 3 million people voted. Turnout over 71%. Uh, the pro-democracy candidates won 388 seats, up from 126, with a similar decline on the pro-establishment candidates. Um, as a result, the pro-democracy bloc will hold a majority in 17 out of 18 of the district councils. Um, you knew all that. Um, my question is, um, what possible leverage does the protest movement gain from that landslide victory, and what impact will these district council elections uh, have on the legislative council elections in 2020? Well, so first of all, on the 24th of November, the pro-democracy camp gains 85% of the district council seats in Zaidi in the 2019 district council election. And there are actually several symbolic meanings that the result brings us. First of all, it is a very encouraging signal that signifies that the majority of Hong Kongers are still in support of the five demands that the protesters had been asking for for the past six months. And it is actually a also a very great advantage that the pro-democracy camp gained that we got more financial resources in support to our to the political prisoners that are put in jail and will be put in jail after the after the trial brought to court. However, one very uncomfortable truth is that the legislative the legislature power that the district council councillors have are actually really small comparing to the legislative council councillors. And we we Hong Kongers are expecting to win more seats in the legislative council election. However, another question about the district about the legislative council election is that even when we got most of the seats for the directly elected legislative councils, the most of the seats of the functional constituencies are still in hands of the pro in hands of the pro Beijing sides, and that is a very great problem that hinders any pr that hinders any acts or bills that are in advantage of the pro-democracy side or Hong Kongers, only bills that benefits pro-Beijing camps or the businessmen will get passed in the Legislative Council. So that's why, that is also one of the reasons why we had been asking for an authentic universal suffrage from both the executive branch and also the legislative branch, because that is the only way to grant us and to grant Hong Kongers a responsive government and also legislative councillors that draft bills that benefits Hong Kongers. Thank you for your response. I want to thank my colleagues for being here, and we now stand adjourned.